Hey, B-Movie Maniacs, welcome to another episode of B-Movie Mania Interviews. Today, I'm chatting with producer and casting director Mark Sykes, who produced the documentary Doomed, the untold story of Roger Corman's The Fantastic Four. Mark has been in the industry for quite a while, and I really enjoyed sitting down with him to chat about the documentary and his time working with Roger Corman and all things Fantastic Four. If you're listening and this happens to be your first time checking out the podcast, consider subscribing uh, for more interviews and reviews and all sorts of good things. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or simply by going to bmoviemania.com. We love B-movies, and if you do too, I think you will enjoy the show. One quick note before we jump into the interview, Mark has this super cool, very old dog named Bear, and you'll probably hear him a few times sort of clomping around the place. So if you're wondering what that is, it's just Bear. He's a cool dude. All right, let's get into it right now. Here is my interview with Mark Sykes. It's B-Movie Mania. Mania. Mark, thanks so much for chatting with me on uh, this little thing we have called B-Movie Mania. My pleasure. Happy to do it. Awesome. Um, You're a casting director. You're a producer. For those uh, who might not be familiar with you, just tell people a little bit about uh, Doomed, the documentary that you produce. Yeah. What's the full title of it? The title of the movie uh, is Doomed, the Untold Story of Roger Corman's The Fantastic Four. Yeah. Marty, the director, uh, demanded we use good English. Okay, good. And just talk a little bit about, you know, what the documentary is um, and kind of how you got involved with it. Sure. Well, Doomed is basically the story of from the day that... um, Bernd Eichinger, who has passed away now but was formerly of New Constantine Films, walked into Roger Corman's office with the option for Fantastic Four waning and a need to go into production by the end of 1992 to maintain his option. We follow the writing, the casting, the uh, production, post-production, and the preliminary steps up to the exhibition that would never happen. Uh, The film follows that, a little bit of the story since and why nobody's ever seen it, and uh, obviously our desire to get Marvel to have mercy on us all and release it someday just to show it to us, whether it's a, a DVD extra on one of the other Fantastic Four or part of a box set of the Fantastic Four movies. Um... And for myself, I mean, I was a casting at the time that we were working on this. I had become the receptionist uh, in the summer. And so this was all taking place in the fall of 92. I was the receptionist, but also because of the path I knew I wanted to go on by then, I was also a casting assistant. Uh, I was doing both jobs, um, being paid as a receptionist, but... Uh, Laura Schiff, the casting director, uh, allowed me to sit in on sessions in exchange for working. You know, I would schedule the sessions and field calls from agents and managers while on the receptionist desk. And it was a very busy desk. I bet. But it was just, I knew within a couple months of arriving at Corman in 92 that I wanted to get into casting. It just really was fun and mm. interesting. I loved actors, and I loved movies and television. So Cool. Yeah. You were involved in this whole Fantastic Four thing. To this day, the movie has still never been officially released in any format. Right. When did you get an opportunity to actually see the finished product for the first time? I, technically speaking, the product was never finished. You know, I, I mean, if we wanted to be real clear, the film was still in the throes of post-production. I mean, I was one of the many hats I wore for Roger Corman was projectionist. I was his projectionist. The receptionist 
always had to learn mail. You had to handle deliveries. You had to handle um, the phones. And you were the projectionist. You were sort of an office manager. Huh. And I was pretty good at it because I was a film student, so I knew my way around projectors. And so even when I became the casting assistant and later the casting director, I was asked to remain the projectionist because I already knew it and I was still in the building. And they didn't screen that many things. So I saw Fantastic Four with Roger, you know, except I was in the projection booth. But other than the changeovers, I, you know, I was sitting there looking through the window, watching it, listening to it for the, you know, 15 minutes until the next changeover hit. So I got to see it on film uh, four or five times as a projectionist and watch it. And then when I finally saw what would be the bootleg, it was years later I get a VHS tape in the mail from my producing partner and the director of Doomed, Marty Langford, and it has uh, Doom. It has Fantastic Four on it. And now I had never seen it at a convention. I never knew it was being bootlegged. And he was like, you got to check this out. And I watched it and I was like, this is our movie and this is the only way it's being released. So it was on VHS. And... and, um that was years later, you said sometime in the 90s, maybe late 90s or? Yeah, that would have been certainly no sooner than, say, 96 or 97. It was definitely in the 90s yeah. because not long after that, the DVDs uh, boots started to show up. By, by then, I was looking for it. I yeah. was pretty savvy, and I then bought a DVD boot of it at a L.A. convention. Gotcha. Um, what was your impression of the film when you originally saw it, having been involved in the casting process and everything? Was the movie what you were expecting when you first got a chance to see it? By the time I got to see assembly cuts in Corman's projection booth, it, it really was more or less what I was expecting. It, it wasn't a great film because it wasn't budgeted accordingly. You can't do a movie with Dr. Doom, the Mole Man, and the Fantastic Four for a million dollars in 1992. You know, there was no CGI, there was no, the special, well, the special effects might qualify technically as CGI, but they were like 80s Saturday morning CGI effects. The Human Torch is, you know, the Human Torch didn't look good. That's probably the most um, egregious. The Invisible Woman was just basically shooting her in the frame and then out of the frame, which, again, it, it's clever, but it's it's cheap. It's, it's Shazam or Incredible Hulk television series bad um, for what we're, we're spoiled to death today, uh, almost to the point where the CGI is distracting yeah. in movies like Justice League. The simple truth is it's just... It's so much better. I, 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 I poo-poo a lot of the fans today who hate these films because I'm like, man, grow up in the 70s and 80s <laughs> and look at the crap we had. Um, I, I was, you know, Fantastic Four was always one of my favorite properties. I love the comic book. I grew up on it. So I, there was a, a sentimental aspect of it. And so I was like, hey, in 92, we didn't have these big special effects movies. So I was like, eh, you know, for Corman, it's what it is. And, and and it's ironic, too, because it's the most loyal to the source material that they've done. Right. It really is. If you could take uh, Craig Nevius's script, you might solve the mystery and crack, uh, crack the code for a good Fantastic Four movie. You just need a bigger budget. Right. You know, that's the big flaw with this movie was the budget. It wasn't the cast. It wasn't... That cast is spot on for what Lee and Kirby envisioned. Uh, I remember looking at Rebecca Staub's headshot and thinking, how more on the mark could you get yeah. for Fantastic Four number one? Um, she was the total package. Right. Perfect cast. And I, and I don't take credit for the casting because Laura was the casting director. I was just the casting assistant. But, I mean, it really was spot on. Yeah. They did a great job. Yeah. So so in Doomed, in the documentary, Roger Corman is interviewed for the film. Yeah. 
how how to say this how how forthcoming was he because i'm sure he was there, 88 he was 88 yeah so he just didn't remember a lot of it he didn't <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very candid with you. Marty and I were a little disappointed, not angry or mad in any way, but he was 88 yeah. and we weren't going to get him. He had said no originally, very nicely, because, you know, former employee, he was polite and political, but he was just not, he hadn't had good experience being the subject of documentaries before in a couple cases. So he was a little gun shy and he had very politely passed. And then Marty arrived in town to shoot. We were already shooting, and I got a friend to beg Roger and use a favor and get him to consent to an interview. And he was just, he was wonderful, but we really, he was the shortest interview. And again, we're sitting in his office where we didn't expect to be. We didn't have our regular DP because it wasn't a day we expected to be shooting. Everything went fine, but it was a little by the seat of our pants. And I only had Marty in town for a couple weeks because he was in Massachusetts. And then here's a great thing that I didn't, I don't really, there's a lot of stuff that you just don't bring up. I still knew a couple people at Corman back then and we were waiting for Roger to, to be ready. And so while Marty was sitting in the lobby that morning waiting to go in and interview Roger, with the, with the permission of the uh, receptionist, who I respected, having done the job, I sneaked down the hall to the back of the building where uh, one of the legal people uh, is still there from when I was there. Oh, wow. And we were good friends. So it was, oh, hey, how are you? Good to see you. I just wanted to come back and say hi. I'm here interviewing Roger. And Roger walks in. And... I'm not 100% sure he recognized me because I hadn't seen him in 10, 12 years. Yeah. And he was very, he said, oh, hello, hi, how are you? Uh, uh, yes, I need a copy of uh, the uh, contract for Fantastic Four. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, I don't think he knows who I am. I don't think he knows I'm here to interview him. And that I now know that he's got to get the contract <laughs> to look it up. And then he just goes, he excuses himself and goes, and I'm just, I stay talking with my friend for five minutes, and then we're ready to shoot. And then when we're interviewing him, he was great, you know, and he couldn't have been nicer. And you can see in the interview, he, he just looks very happy and at peace, you know, he by then had an Oscar in his possession. He won the uh, Lifetime Achievement Oscar, and that'll put a smile on anybody's face. I just kind of, we were there to interview him about how he came into possession of these rights for this huge property and to get his remembrance because, of course, Baron Dykinger is gone. You know, he passed away about seven or eight, ten years ago. So we can't get him. Roger's one of the only top key players um, from the producer's side that we were going to get. Avi Arad wasn't returning calls. There's... Uh kind of a theory, I guess, that you touch on in the film, or, the, or that is touched on in the film, that maybe even Roger didn't know that the film was never intended to be released. Do you have any sort of personal belief as to whether or not that's true, that he didn't know? Roger's a really, is and was a very smart guy. His, one of his heads of production, Steve Rabner, who was also one of the producers on the film, was an Ivy League lawyer. Smart, smart guy. These guys looked over any deal they made with Baron Dykinger and Constantine. Roger had a, a legal team back then. There were two or three lawyers in-house. So I am sure... And the contract would prove this. We couldn't get our hands on it. But the contract would prove it. I'm sure Eichinger and Constantine Films had some stipulation in there. Because um, it's not just going to come out of nowhere. It's got to be written down somewhere. Well, Eichinger, we're, we're pretty sure, just was making the movie to maintain the rights. 
So I almost think even if he had lost money on the film, ultimately, he wouldn't have cared because he's seeing the big picture. And by making that film, he retains the rights for, I don't know, another six or eight years. And I'm sure he's hoping that Fox will make the film uh, bigger. So I, I don't think this was ever the end game was, hey, let's do a million dollar Fantastic Four. Uh, rumor has it that he spent somewhere in the vicinity of 400000 for the option. So you're not planning. He was shopping it around. Um, and we know this. He was shopping this around in the late 80s, early 90s at studios to make a much bigger production. Is there a clause in the contract? I can't tell you. I honestly don't know, and I never looked it over, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was. And plus, he probably knew, at least verbally, he and Roger may have discussed, like, hey, Marvel may want to buy it and do whatever they are going to do with it, in which case, we're going to make some money. Roger, at the very least, would have had the right to either make a certain amount of money or release the film. Yeah. You know, who knew if they were smart enough to foresee that? Right. So one of the coolest parts about the documentary is finding out that you played the thing for <laughs> yeah. like a day or whatever it was. Oli almost fell out of his chair in that interview. <laughs> he he didn't, didn't know. He didn't remember it in a heartbeat. And Marty ran with it. And we we knew the minute it happened in the interview, we were going to keep that in the film no yeah. matter what, because it was such a cool moment. Yeah. But how did that come about? And how did you feel at the time, you know, finding out that, hey, this is cool. I get to run around and, you know, in L.A. is the thing. It was a dream come true. I did it for free. Um, they were breaking all kinds of rules doing it, not having a stuntman do it, number one, and then having me do it off the books, total violations of everything, and I couldn't care less. I was like, oh, you want me to put on the Thing costume and run around Hollywood Boulevard tonight? I was like, holy moly. I would have paid them. Yeah. Uh, and literally, again, like he did with the original script, Steve Radner just came, Radner came up to me and said, hey, uh, how would you like to do this tonight? And I, it, it, there was no negotiation. There was no... I was like, when and where? Where do I need to be? When and where? And now here's an interesting thing, which I don't know that we ended up using in the documentary, but this was kind of fun. I also destroyed the thing costume in part. Oh, wow. Yeah, the feet were made for somebody with, I think, I think it was, they had smaller feet maybe. Uh, and the costume had already had a lot of wear and tear. And don't forget, we weren't doing this the right way. They weren't <laughs> using everybody. Um, I don't even think they brought the makeup and, and effects people there. I think I think it was literally a gorilla shoot. We certainly didn't have permits. I wasn't the guy who should have been in the costume technically. It wasn't. I mean, that thing was that was a plaster. You see in the documentary, uh, Carl, they plastered to put his body in and everything. It was fit for his body. Right. And I wasn't the same body as him. So I'm up on Hollywood Boulevard with feet, thing feet, which I've already, they already had some damage, but then I uh, got, got holes in them. And, and the, I remember the effects people like a week later being super pissed off um, that they had done that. Because, you know, uh, I'm sure they were going to keep it as a showpiece. And at the time, everybody thought this was going to be a big release. And so to think that they ran out in a gorilla shoot with some idiot from the office putting on the costume and ripping the sides of it and all that. And fortunately, there's no close ups or uh, there's just extreme close ups oh, okay. of the mask. You see my eyes looking in the little broken mirror and then you just see me walking across Hollywood Boulevard scaring the bejesus out of everybody. Well, that was going to be my next question. There had to have been some good reactions from the people when you were walking around down there. Yeah. Well, that's sure because it was totally Real. I mean, they these those were not extras. Those were people walking across Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Imagine. And I mean, again, it's ninety two, so you didn't have like now you've got Iron Man and Superman and Spider Man walking around posing for pictures in Hollywood Boulevard. I was an anomaly. Here was this goofball in a, in a very cool looking costume 
just walking across the street. So you get these very real reactions from people like startled and not sure what to make of me. And it was perfect. It was it fit the story sure. we were telling. Yeah. Um, he wasn't the ever loving, blue eyed, lovable New York thing then. You know, he wasn't famous. This was the origin story. So people didn't know what to make of the thing. Right. And uh, I, I just remember having to run at times because the light, you know, they didn't want me to run across the street. They wanted me to just lumber along, you know, sort of disoriented. And the light wasn't that long. And Hollywood Boulevard is a good stretch. So I, I would have to get about two thirds of the way and then run <laughs> and just they couldn't use it. But it was like, dude, you know, if you had permits, you could control the lights. But we're just out here gorilla. I didn't want to get hit by a car because there was no visibility. Oh, yeah. I could see literally straight ahead of me. So That's it, awesome. It was, oh, it was so much fun. That's yeah. so cool. Do you think that there's any sort of lesson to be learned? Let's say that uh, there's a young filmmaker listening to the podcast right now. Do you think there's any sort of lesson to be learned from what happened with the whole Fantastic Four conundrum? Or do you think that it's such a unique an anomaly there's, that there's not really much that you can get in that respect out of it? No, I mean, I, I, I think it's an anomaly in specifics, but I mean, there's a lot of cases of Hollywood where expect the unexpected, the Blair Witch... You know, I'm sure there's at least an actor or two on the Blair Witch who wish they'd negotiated a better back end. Uh, and there's a lot of movies where that happens, where the agent maybe didn't get as aggressive as possible. And I deal with agents for a living, and I can never get irritated with them when they want to cover all possible events. Well, what if this movie goes big? You know, and I might be making a SAG ultra low budget movie for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or a quarter of a million, and and the agents are like, well, you know, we just want to have a back end if there's a theatrical release, and I might say, well, there isn't going to be a theatrical release of this film. It's going right up on the Sci Fi Channel and right up on Amazon and Hulu and Netflix, and then they're like, well, then you have nothing to lose by giving us this in the event of a theatrical release and mm -hmm. that way our client is protected and a lot of that sprang from Blair Witch and a lot of similar things I don't think Fantastic Four in the 90s was some famous Hollywood story but I do think it's a cautionary tale because you know those actors as you know in the documentary they went out of pocket for a lot of stuff which they shouldn't have done and they, frankly, shouldn't have been allowed to do, no matter what. Uh, they were smart to do it for themselves if everything went as planned. They rolled the dice and they took a beating. But they never got reimbursed for any of that money. And they never saw a penny of residuals. Now, it would have taken a mentalist of an agent to say, well, in case the film is never released, we want this in the contract. Nobody thinks of that. And I'm not saying that should be a clause, but it's a very strong argument for actors and their agents to think, hey, it's not crazy to try to negotiate, you know, promotional uh, fees, reimbursements, and I don't know, uh, guarantee of tape you know I mean I don't even know if the actors across the board ever saw footage from the film and you know they never saw a penny of residuals which technically isn't a SAG violation because there were no residuals to get but I'm sure each of those leads at the time was assuming there'd at least be a minimal Residual. I know many actors, when they do low-budget projects, they're already calculating the initial amount, the airing, the overseas, home video, you know, DVD, internet now, new media. And to have all that wiped away, I don't know what an actor or an agent or even crew people can make of that, but... I think it is a cautionary tale, just in an, in an overall sense, saying, be careful and, and try to negotiate for things that are unexpected. Because if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Yeah. 
if uh, people listening would like to reach out to you, I don't know how much you do, you know, social media or anything like that, but is there any anywhere people can go to, uh, you know, kind of follow uh, what you're up to? Um, the Casting Corner Facebook page is one way, and then follow me on Twitter at CastingGuy, C-A-S-T-N-G-U-Y. Um, and we'll put some links down below on the yeah. website to that. <clears throat> and the Doomed page. I mean, all things Doomed and Doomed-related, and we're going to do another documentary before long, and we'll do all the publicity for that, and it'll probably uh, at least spawn from the Doomed page and the fans of the Doomed project and stuff like that. Cool. Facebook, yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much for chatting with me. I was really Anytime. looking forward to this, and I Great. really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Listen up, maniacs. Do you have a question or a comment? Would you like to uh, send some bourbon to Uncle Lloydie? You can contact the gang on Facebook at B-Movie Mania. You can also drop them a line at bmoviemania.com. Reach out, touch them. They are touching themselves and they might just reach back. I'm Lloyd Kaufman saying, see you next time on B-Movie Mania. Woohoo!